Okay, so I'll now introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Zosia Archibald, Senior Lecturer in Classical Archaeology at the University of Liverpool. She has published widely uh, on the history and archaeology of Northern Greece and Bulgaria, notably uh, 2013 monograph, Ancient, Ancient Economies of the Northern Aegean. Uh, she has been very much involved in the excavations uh, at Olympus, and she's going to talk about those to us today. And her title is, Now at Last We Have Our Opportunity in Olympus, Glossomenes 1-9, Attractions Ancient and Modern in the North, The Olympus Project 2014-2017. Thank you very much, Peter. I hope you can all hear me. I'm afraid my voice <coughs> is, not, is not in the best of health, but I will do my best to speak clearly, and I hope you will all hear. And to begin, whilst uh, trying to avoid any similarities between this presentation and one at the Oscars, I would nevertheless like to express my thanks and appreciation to the various organisations that have contributed significantly to the success, well to the creation as well as to the success of this project, which happens under the auspices of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and the British School at Athens, which holds the permit for the project, the local administration in the Halkidic Peninsula, the effort of Halkidiki, as well as the effort of Pella, whose director is our colleague and co-director, Dr. Bettina Tsigarida, the University of Michigan, the Department of Classical Studies and the Kelsey Museum, and the School of Histories, Languages and Cultures of my own University of Liverpool, as well as the very many individuals who cannot be named individually, both colleagues, specialists and students who participated in the first four seasons, the first four years, in fact, at Olympus under this new project. The title of this lecture relates to the first speech listed in the Demosthenic Corpus, which has come to be known as the first Olynthiac oration. This is one of three speeches written by Demosthenes, thought by scholars to have been presented to the Athenian assembly in the course of the year 349 BC, although the exact order is uncertain. As my colleague Christopher Tuplin pointed out in a learned discussion of these speeches published in 1998, it is not easy to understand how these three speeches relate to events that were moving extremely fast in the northern parts of the Balkan Peninsula, and even harder to relate to the information that we apparently do have about what took place at Olynthus itself. There is no clear relationship, it seems, between Demosthenes' harangues of the Athenian people and three fragments from the distinguished historian Philochorus, whose Athenian history, or Apthis, repeated apparently verbatim by Dionysius of Halicarnassus, in which military forces were sent to Olympus by the Athenian state in three successive parties during the year 349, as you see on the screen now. Demosthenes refers to Olympus in other later speeches, usually with implied shock, not to say disgust, but nowhere did the orator actually describe the context of what was happening, much less provide a clear exposition of the interactions between different interested groups. 
There is nothing in the whole corpus of Demosthenic speeches like the coolly factual snippets that survive from Philochorus at this. Perhaps we should not expect too much from speeches that were intended for an audience that could all too easily be distracted. If we were a bit mischievous, we might be tempted to say that Demosthenes was not averse to a few alternative facts. Whatever the reality, we are left to put the pieces together as best we can. For most students of classical antiquity, it is Demosthenes who first comes to mind when the name Olynthus is mentioned, because his speeches have formed such an important part of the training of classics graduates all over the world. It also means that unconsciously, perhaps, the Demosthenic perspective on history has prevailed over those of other agents in this story. Nevertheless, the Olynthiacs make a useful starting point for our reflections today. One of the underlying themes of Demosthenes' rhetoric is that of opportunity. The term kairos recurs throughout the Olynthiacs. For the orator, this was about seizing the chance to take advantage of Philip II of Macedon, whose activities were knocking Athenian overseas policy into a cocked hat. The theme of opportunity is one that I want to follow up in the course of this lecture. It runs like a thread woven into the texture of investigations at this remarkable ancient city site. Opportunity was also the conscious theme alluded to by Alan Wace, director of the British School at Athens, who can be considered the first modern scholar to identify the site of Olynthus correctly. And we see his picture here on the right and on the left with a group of colleagues, Greek archaeologists, at Mycenae at a celebratory dinner. And here I would like to quote from Wace's published study about the site of Olynthus from 1916. And he says... Early in 1915, during a short journey in Macedonia, I took the opportunity of exploring the site and neighbourhood of Olynthus. Because it is hoped that the British school at Athens will, before long, be able to begin excavations there. I spent two days in the territory of Olynthus, examining sites at Hagios Mamas, Myriophyton, and Molivapurgos, as well as ruins at Pisla, Megazudia, and Palaiopotes, all near Polygyros, which are those of medieval or modern villages. Although somewhat impeded by a heavy fall of snow, I had the satisfaction of seeing for myself the comparative warmth of the climate of Olynthus, even in winter. And I'm just going to give you a couple of other extracts from this short study. The low ground towards the coast is covered with olive groves, while the hills to the north are clothed with oak woods, which were undoubtedly finer in antiquity than they are today. In addition to its other advantages, from Polygyros there runs the best road northwards into the upper country. Iron is said to be found in the hills and today mines of chrome and manganese are working along the coast. And I've been to some of them. Some useful practical foundations for future British activities in Macedonia had already been laid in March 1911 
When the Macedonian Exploration Fund was established, a committee of Oxford and Cambridge scholars was to conduct research on the history, archaeology and anthropology of Balkan lands. Alan Wace and Maurice Thompson were engaged to carry out the research. Wace may have identified the site of Olynthus, but in the event he was not to return to the site or develop a programme of survey or excavation there. Although he was keen, as the British school's director, to keep the school's activities going as the First World War commenced, new British projects were unthinkable. And so, still in 1915, he joined Carl Blagan's excavations at Koraku near Corinth, sponsored by the American School of Classical Studies. Wace was soon seconded to the British legation in Athens and was apparently responsible for the creation of the first known system of passport control in order to prevent spies moving freely between Athens and Egypt. Later, Wace became involved in archaeological investigations in southern Greece, notably at Mycenae, which became the fulcrum of his research activities. It was David Moore Robinson, whom you see here on the right in the plus fours, professor of classics and later classical archaeology at Johns Hopkins University, who was to resume where Wace effectively left off. This part of my story is rather better known because of the ways in which Robinson's project embedded itself as a key contribution to scholarship on classical cities. Classical urban development and the most comprehensive study of ancient residential accommodation anywhere in the pre-Roman Mediterranean. Before we look at Robinson's oeuvre more closely, it is worth reflecting on why Wace and then Robinson made Olynthus the focus of their energies. After all, Olynthus certainly did not loom large in the minds of modern travellers and antiquarians in the previous two centuries. It was not the target of dilettante enthusiasts who depended on scholars to blaze them a trail. In some respects, if it had not been for Robinson's energetic engagement with Olynthus and his financial resources, Olynthus might still be considered no more than a moderately interesting classical site. Yet Wace's fundamental role in distinguishing the likeliest location of Olynthus deserves its due. I should note that the Wikipedia page on Robinson claims that he was the, the uh, man who discovered the location. Wace had developed a sensitive eye for the archaeological landscape of northern Greece, having spent several decades exploring the settlement mounds known in the literature as magulas or tells and funeral mounds of Thessaly in the company of Maurice Scott Thompson. It was this experience that enabled him to single out Hagios Mamas as a prehistoric tell settlement and the adjacent table-like hill girded in the middle by a saddle depression as Olynthus. There was epigraphic evidence to support the identification, including the key text recording an alliance between King Amintas III of Macedon and the Chalcidians, dating to the 390s or possibly to the 380s, which had been taken to Vienna. And this is number 12 in the corpus of inscriptions known as Rhodes Osborne. 
Wace also noted in his 1916 article a number of other inscriptions discovered in the village of Miriofito and in the vicinity of Olynthus and Hagios Mammoth. Robinson's expedition has been widely studied and is referenced in any discussion of ancient housing and urban layouts. The 14 volumes of Olynthus monographs were duly published by Johns Hopkins University Press between 1928 and 1952, even if Robinson himself subsidised these outputs as he had done the excavations from his own resources, as well as monies raised in a variety of ways. He was an effective, <coughs> if also self-interested, project manager. He made sure that reports of his seasons were made av available in a very timely way, and the monographs that constitute the main though by no means the only legacy of this extraordinary project, appeared with notable promptitude following the fieldwork. Despite Robinson's manifest success in completing his project, the final season of which took place in 1938, Robinson's achievements did not receive universal approbation. Many of his colleagues in the American School of Classical Studies, as well as archaeologists working elsewhere in Greece, were critical of his working methods and what seemed to some the unseemly haste with which he rushed to print. It is instructive in terms of the current Olynthus project to consider Alan Wace's own response to the publication of volume two of the excavations at Olynthus. This is a review in classical, <coughs> classical review for 1931. And here is a little extract. Professor Robinson has been commendably quick, in other words, with his publication. The plans and the houses are distinctly interesting and resemble the earlier houses at Priene, which date from the laying out of the city in Alexander's time. But the author who assumes that Olynthus was never re-inhabited after its destruction by Philip II in 348 BC, dates all its houses in consequence to the 5th century or to the first half of the 4th. It must be confessed that most of the houses from their plans would have been called early Hellenistic without the literary evidence, which is not necessarily conclusive. And he cited here the, the example of Mycenae, which became a Kome, or a, a suburb of the city of Argos in the third century BC. And we certainly know that some of the population of Olynthus was rehoused in a new urban centre at Cassandria, in the leftmost finger, the westernmost finger of the Halkidic Peninsula. So Wace continues, a resettlement under Alexander or Cassander should not be excluded in his view. And as regards the South Hill, no sections of any part of the excavated area are given. This really is a black spot as far as archaeologists are concerned. Much, of course, depends on the character and stratification of the pottery and other finds in the houses. 
though Professor Robinson states that no stratification could be determined. It is hoped that Professor Robinson will be able to return to Olynthus and check his conclusions by stratigraphic soundings in the areas already explored. The sections on loom weights gives useful information about a class of objects often rather neglected by excavators. More lettering on the plans and illustrations, which are not all of good quality, would have made this report easier to read and use. With the benefit of hindsight, we can appreciate what Wace was reluctant to underscore, as well as the things that investigators of the 1920s and 30s failed to see. Anyone who reads Olynthus Volume 2 and tries to understand what was happening on the South Hill will quickly discover that the information is confusing and opaque. And I think you can see this from the plans. This is a reproduction of the plans that appear in Robinson's monograph. So this is the plan that was presented in Volume 2. I will return to the topic of five in due course. The Robinson team began work adjacent to and on top of the South Hill, which is the most complex and challenging part of the site. So it is hardly surprising that Robinson soon abandoned the, air, uh, the area in favour of the North Hill and its more promising and accessible sectors at that. In the 1990s, the 16th Ephoria of the Greek Archaeological Service successfully carried out a conservation project in a limited rectangular sector which constituted some of the best preserved and best documented houses on the North Hill. And this is what you can see on this aerial photograph. This is the conserved area which you can visit today. So it represents a small part of Robinson's excavations and is the pink area in this image here and has been used for various reconstructions of the plan of Olynthus uh, as in this plan from Hopfner and Schwantner's book on uh, Greek architecture. So in addition to the the uh, rectangular conservation area on the North Hill. The conservation team were hoping to extend this to the public areas on the South Hill, but funds did not allow this at the time. Most of the controversies that dogged Robinson's project continued to fuel debate amongst classical archaeologists into the 1980s and 1990s. Both Lisa Nevitt and Nicholas Cahill wrote doctoral theses that made use of the unpublished notebooks written by members of the Robinson team. In his 2002 book, Household and City Organisation of Olynthus, Nicholas Cahill pulled together many of the fundamental problems of the spatial distribution of finds and their chronological implications. 
In the final decade of the 20th century, the work of the Copenhagen Polis Centre once more reignited scholarly interest in ancient classical sites and their urban as well as their constitutional histories. Olynthus emerged as one of the largest and most powerful entities in northern Greece. A new appraisal of Olynthus was needed to take Robinson's work forward into the 21st century. Nicholas Cahill himself became involved in the Sardis expedition. Meanwhile, in 2012, Professor Leva Nevitt of Michigan University, who was keen to develop her research on household activities at the micro as well as the macro level, met Dr. Bettina Tsigarida, then of the 16th Ephorate of the Greek Archaeological Service, who had been closely involved in the conservation project at Olynthus in the 1990s and had long planned to revive research at the site. I myself became involved as the team's British School at Athens representative, as a classical archaeologist with a regional interest in the north and a scholar of ancient economies. The new Olynthus project, which began in 2014 as a sunegazia, that is a collaboration between the Greek Archaeological Service, in this case the Ephoria of Halkidiki, and the Universities of Michigan and Liverpool under the auspices of the British School at Athens. The project operates within a seven square kilometre area that is inside the white dotted line, incorporating both the North and the South Hill, the North Hill and the South Hill, as well as agricultural land outside the designated archaeological perimeter, which includes known structures investigated by Robinson's team and others identified subsequently. And most of these are in the area, in this area just to the east of both the hills. And this is the village of Nea Olynthos, which replaced the village of Miriofitone that was referred to in Wace's report. And uh, the dotted line runs along the course of the Resetnikia or Olynthios River. The aims of the new project are to gain a clearer understanding of the long-term social history of Olynthos in its wider topographical and ecological context. To analyse domestic social and economic dynamics through the use of the most up-to-date scientific field and laboratory methods, exploring at least one complete residential property on the North Hill and one on the South Hill. The third aim is to develop a spatial set of data for the civic site and its rural territory using a combination of survey photographic, geomorphological and geophysical me methods. And here are the three new directors of the current project. Our first steps were to set up a new digital grid for the area to be studied using a digital GPS and based on the existing two successive Greek topographic map grids and to match these with aerial and satellite photographs. Once the initial grid was in place, we could proceed to geophysical prospection. This involved a variety of techniques. We first tried resistivity and magnetometry, both of which yielded successful results. The implementation was challenging for the participants who had to endure heavy rainfall and unpleasant spiky shrubs. 
Robinson's photographs of the two hills show only short grass and few shrubs with few trees, probably a reflection of the agricultural and pastoral cycle in place before the formal designation of the site in the 1960s. Resistivity showed up the outlines of structures and their subdivisions most clearly, while magnetometry pointed out the areas of burnt clay and other burnt features. A number of anomalies were selected for investigation using test trenches. One of these was selected for the excavation of a complete house beginning in 2015. The other test trenches provided a wealth of data, some residential, but some also distinctly non-residential. And this includes uh, traces of what is probably the fortification wall made of uh, mud bricks on uh, a rough stone foundation, as well as a variety of features here which appear to be non-residential, possibly cultic. Over the course of four seasons, Geophysical Survey has continued with full investigation of the South Hill as well as the North Hill and selected areas between them as well as accessible parts of the agricultural land between the hills. The techniques used have included resistivity and magnetometry but also electromagnetic survey using a mini explorer provided by the University of Bradford and another loaned by the Foundation for Research and Technology, Crete. There has also been some limited application of ground penetrating radar. These different techniques have together produced a great deal of new information about subsurface features, which we are only just beginning to interpret and understand. The house selected on the North Hill, for, if we go back one, uh, you can see that the outline of this house appears here. And this is the house which we have selected for complete excavation. And what you see here is uh, an aerial view of the 13 trenches that were excavated between 2015 and 2016 with the north wall of the house here, a north wing of rooms, a central area here with a sh covered working space and a uh, courtyard, as well as about four rooms on the front facing another road. In the middle of the house is what remains of the stone foundation of a staircase with collapsed debris from the roof, uh, from the room above. And this is behind uh, a complex that includes a bathroom with a bath in situ uh, against the back wall and a small passageway between the house and the adjoining house. Here we see a number of items that have collapsed onto this stone foundation at the bottom of the staircase in the process of excavation. Ceramic finds. There is no doubt that the profile of ceramic finds is very different from the ones suggested and indeed summarised by Robinson. And I'm going to cite here uh, a couple of paragraphs from a forthcoming article which was presented as a paper to the Conference on Classical Pottery of the Northern Aegean in May 2017. And this is authored by Bradley Alt, Kathleen Lynch, Anna Pandey and the directors. The 13 trenches laid out over House B96, this is using the vocabulary of Robinson's organisation of space, have yielded more than two metric tonnes of ceramic material. This includes over 1,800 kilograms of roof tiles, some nine kilos of fine ware, 109 kilos of medium ware, 
4.5 kilos of courseware, nearly 74 kilos of amphorae, and just over 20 kilos of pithosware, other storage containers, that is. Even when subtracting the roof tiles, which account for over 88% of the ceramic assemblage, the remaining 216.678 kilograms of pottery is still impressive. Over 50% of this material comprised medium wear fabrics. 34% was made up of amphorae, 9% of pithos wear, 4% of fine wear, and 2% of coarse wear. Comparing these results with the ceramics reported and published by Robinson in Alintha's volume 13, the only volume devoted exclusively to pottery, is immediately instructive. I'm still citing the report uh, I've referred to. Of the 1,124 catalogue entries there, less than 20% are devoted to non-fineware vessels. The original excavators concentrated instead on publishing not only fine wares, but decorated examples and whole vessels, many of which were recovered from the cemetery excavations. Of the 883 vessels counted here, 365, or 41.66%, come from mortuary contexts. As for non-fine wares, only two cooking pots of the variety known as Hutrai were published, and these both come from the same two. Similarly, among transport amphorae, the only published examples include two intact specimens, 23 stamped handles, and one additional fragment of a ring and neck. In Nicholas Cahill's recent important reappraisal of the site, Household and City Organisation at Olynthus, he notes that another 8,123 artefacts can be accounted for in the original excavation notebooks, which did not see the light of day in the final reports. Unquote. Notwithstanding the encouraging words of Alan Wace about loom weights, only a tiny sample of the several thousands reportedly discovered were in fact published by Robbins. And just to give you an idea about the, the, um, <coughs> the, the, the perceptions and reality, here we have a small black glazed bowl from our current excavations and a photograph of similar vessels from Robinson's excavation. But in statistical terms, this is not very meaningful. Now, a little on microstratigraphy and micromorphology, as well as flotation. From the notebooks of the Robinson team, we can glean that it took approximately five days to excavate one house. Five days, one house. The Olympus project began the excavation of house B96 in 2015, and completion ex is expected in 2018. One of the reasons for these very different rates of progress is the use of context-based excavation methods. But sampling for geochemistry, micromorphology, and microstratigraphy is also time-consuming. Results from samples studied so far suggest that these techniques are yielding valuable information about the distribution of food-related activities in different parts of the house. While plant residues are also providing considerable information about diet and agricultural practices, including several varieties of cereal, grape, and olive pips, as well as plants of cultivation. The South Hill deserves separate consideration. And this is a photograph of the public area as it looks today, the so-called public area, as described by Robinson. The South Hill was the nucleus of the earliest settlement. What the combined techniques of remote sensing have revealed is an intricate pattern of streets.
which do not follow a regular plan, although there is a pattern to the system, of the system of interconnected blocks of houses and their adjacent thoroughfares. And I think you can probably make out how the blocks look from this diachronic image with some of the intervening streets and one or two that run north-south, which were identified by Robinson. So this is, this is the resistance image, and this is the electromagnetic image. Notable are the curved streets running west-east. The challenge for the final two seasons will be to detect stratigraphic changes to the street and house layouts which represent an accumulation of at least 300 years. And here is another view uh, showing uh, the, a slightly different presentation of the same data. Uh, finally, intensive survey has been conducted across the two hills and over much of the study area of seven square kilometres, revealing variable densities of residential data, almost all of which dates from the 5th and 4th centuries BC, with the exception of one Byzantine site. On the left of this slide, we have a presentation of the intensive survey results from the South Hill showing uh, the distribution of Iron Age materials. So this is material belonging to the first half of the first millennium BC, overlying Robinson's plan here, which represents trenches rather than features in some cases. And on the right, we have different concentrations of material picked up during the survey. So a predictable concentration with uh, down the slopes of the hill here. But clearly, there are variable concentrations which need further analysis. The Olympus project has two field seasons yet to run, 2018 and 2019, and subsequent study seasons. We have already demonstrated that a new project at Olympus can and has delivered new data, which will, for the first time, make the site directly comparable to other urban centres, not just in the Mediterranean, but in other parts of Europe and elsewhere. It is transforming our understanding of the local ecology of Olynthus and of resource exploitation. I can only refer parenthetically to the studies of local stone, clay and ores, as well as charcoal. Much remains to be done. Time does not allow me to do more than mention ongoing work on the commercial interconnections of Olynthus. I illustrate here some of the statistics of different coin finds from cities in the region. The local relations between Halkidians and Botians in the vicinity of Olynthus. And the task of reconstructing an Olynthian house digitally based on the excavation data and calculated resources. The Olynthus project will help scholars understand the inward, continental-looking aspects of the site, as well as the better-known outward-looking ones. Thank you very much for your attention.